So welcome to uh, our latest Blues Zoom and uh, next to me a very familiar face now with the England setup, the under 21 coach, uh, Michael Johnson, of course, a legend with Blues going back way back to the, what was it, John, 1990s, mid 90s? Yeah, uh, and early 2000s. Yeah, so don't just leave me in the 90s or <laughs> 2000s as well. Hey man, they were good days, let me tell you. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, uh, the years fly past, don't they? Before we get on to Blues, let's just t talk about England because you, you, you know, when, when, the, when the Blues job came up and your name sort of came up and you've got all your badges, just tell us what you, how many badges you have got now. You've got a lot, haven't you? Yeah, I've got them all. I mean, the requisites you need to, to manage is the pro licence. Um, and I've had that since 2014. <clears throat> so I've got that. I've got numerous other badges as well. I've got two master's degrees. Um, studied at university for a sporting directorship wow. and also called UEFA Masters for International Players and um, also got my diploma in football management, which is a, a course with the LMA. Um, I've also got a, an accreditation in, in corporate governance. Um, I've also got my coach educators um, license, which allows me to coach other coaches. Um, and I've got all my FA youth uh, modules, you know, one, two, threes. I, I could, I could go on. I could. Continue. In other words, in other words, you should be prime minister, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stacked as my son. You are stacked. My... All right, listen, listen. Before Blues, then, um, how is it? Uh, you just qualified for the under 21s for next for next year, uh, which is great. Eddie and Ketty has got that record, hasn't he? As a top goal scorer. Um, yeah. I, I guess you know. We want to know about Jude as well. He's, I mean, he's a phenomenon, isn't he, really? Just tell us, how's he, how's he been with you? He's been great. Obviously, I knew, my t I knew Jude from the time at um, Blues because he was a young boy coming up in the academy then when I was actually the ambassador but had a role in the academy coaching. So I always knew that he was one destined for real greatness. You, you're kind of concerned because obviously with you, young players, you don't know how they're going to go. Is it computer? Is it out on the on the streets with some of your friends and you just kind of hope that he would keep his head level headed. Um, but he's more than done that. You know, he's a terrific comedy. Uh, um, he's a terrific player to be accommodated by us, you know, for, for us coming into the 21 setup with his character and his performance levels and his youthful exuberance. He's been brilliant for us. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's, it's incredible to think that he's, he's now playing Champions League football as well. Uh, Lucien Favre, the, 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 the uh, uh, Dortmund coach, described him as a, a fantastic presence, which at 17 years and three and a bit months is, is something else, isn't it? Yeah, he beholds the, the fact that he's only 17. Um, he, you know, he, the way he carries himself, his mindset and his outlook on not only the game, but life. You know, it lends itself to someone a lot more senior than Jude Bellingham's tender years on this planet. But he's a really good player, um, really good character. And, um, you know, let's watch his space because I think he's, if he keeps going the way he is, things can only get better. Yeah, when he's, when he's around the sort of the rest of the players, because I mean, in the other 21 group at the moment, I mean, if we're looking about England, you know, potential World Cup winners, these guys are going to be down the line, going to be involved, aren't they? Does he, does he fit in nice and comfortable with, with all those guys? 
Yeah, he's fitted in really well. I mean, he's coming to camp, the last two camps, fitted in really well. Um, you would have thought he's been there for, for years, let alone it's, it's only two camps. And um, I think Jude can adjust to that. And, and, and the way he's adjusted to the camp, I'm sure that's the way he's adjusting to life over in Germany. Mm. How's he like with you? Is he, does he sort of seek advice? I mean, you always get the impression that he's, you know, he's, he's just like a sponge, really, and, and, and wanting to... Yeah, uh, we, we, we talk and we've had conversation, um, obviously, because we're in camp together now for the best part of 10 days. Um, I've caught him a couple of times trying to learn his German, um, <laughs> which, has been, which has been interesting. Um, but yeah, it's great. I mean, we obviously chat about blues and he, he's obviously his big love is blues. Um, so it's good to c connect with him on that level as well. Yeah, just before we go on to Blues, Job, the, the younger brother, have you come across him yet? Because he's, 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 he's in the age groups, isn't he? But obviously he's, he's only, what, 15 now? Um, have you yeah. come across him yet or not? No, I don't know so much about Job. I mean, I, I remember him, but not so much. It was Jude as a, when I was in the academy. He, Jude would have been probably 12, 13 yeah. um, at the time. And stood out then, didn't he? We've seen all the videos. I was looking at one the other day, actually, when he sort of ran the length of the pitch and he was playing against yeah. 23s when he was 15 and set up a goal. Brilliant stuff. So, yeah, um, it's great to see. Now, listen, you are, you're perfectly qualified um, with all your badges um, and, and you know how to defend. <laughs> you remember how great you were for, for the club. Um, Karanka's come in and he's got this, you know, this, this really defensive mindset where, you know, Blues um, have been hard to sit leaking goals left, right and centre, average of three a game towards the end of last season. All of a sudden, it's tightened right up, but there's a big payoff at the other end. What, what do you, is, is that what we have to accept now, that, you know, you can't have one without the other with, with, your, with your coaching head on, or is there a happy medium to be had? No, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a balance that needs to be struck. I mean, the game's obviously about scoring goals, but I think the first point of call for any manager, if you're, leaking goals, if you're losing games, is how can you stop that? I think once you can stop that, then the next point of call is, OK, how do we start to be a little bit more creative? How do we take the team from, from defensive positions into attacking positions now? Um, and so it's still early days, and I would really encourage the fans to, to, to support what he's trying to do, because I think the, main, the most difficult thing in any game is to score goals but if he's managed to stop the goals then obviously a lot more sessions now on the training field being more creative a bit more expansive I'm sure that will be in his next method of thinking yeah I don't know if you saw the, the game against Norwich the other night did you John the one nil defeat very late goal down to 10 men and, and uh, Norwich scored but you know they had the they had massive amount of possession um, do you see it it was did you, did you get, no, yeah. I've seen highlights of it. I mean, I always try and catch up, obviously, and I knew that um, the Blues had conceded late on in the game. Uh, what minute was it, Chris? 87, I think. Yeah, it was. Uh, Alan Clayton got sent off, uh, and literally 30 seconds later, they scored. But, um, but the thing is, you know, I mean, this sort of defensive mindset, uh, they played with three central defenders the other night, and you got the sort of wing backs as well. But, it, you know, it, one thing I did notice, Jono, is that you know, the players really buy into it. You could see, you know, people like George Friend, who's coming from Middlesbrough and, and the defensive midfielders, you know, that everyone's defending for their lives. There's no, you know, I mean, they, they really, they, they have bought into it. Uh, but, you know, there is this, you know, just paucity of attacking threat. There is none at the moment. So you, you're saying, be patient, are you? That, that, it, that will Yeah, come. absolutely. I think, you know, from my aspect as a coach and obviously as a manager as well, which I'm fortunate to have been, is that if you go into a, a, an organisation, usually you go in there because there's a problem. Um, and, and it looks like the manager has obviously identified the problem, but as you said, it's fixed that leaking goals, but then we're not scoring goals. But I think the first point of call is, okay, it's fixed the defence. It's a lot more tighter, it's a lot more rigid. Um, and now then, okay, how do we build? I mean, we're still in the early stages of the season. But the fact that you're telling me that the defence looks a lot more tighter, the team looks a lot more um, purpose around defending, not just the back four, but as a collective, because everybody's got to buy into what the manager's doing, defending mm. starts from the front, then I think you're hard to break down. And I think that's always, for me, what you build on. Yeah. You, know, you know, attackers and wide players can win your matches, 
but defend defenders will win your leagues because it's a 46 league campaign and so if you if you're conceding less but you can start to prize one or two goals then you're in a good position yeah mm. can, can you can you can you do what you're saying without two holding midfielders at the moment because you know the, the big difference you can see that, that he's made he's got Adam Clayton he's got Sunjic you know both accomplished players Clayton's obviously past 30 now and he was part of the Middlesbrough side that did really well under him when they got promotion a few years ago but I mean when you've got two holding midfielders like that does it sort of does it compromise what you can do going forward not really because it depends how you use them um, because you might be releasing one of the midfielders once they get into a a nice attacking part of the field, whether it's the final third or the opposing half. Um, usually you use two midfielders because it's obviously one reason is, to, as you said, to shore it up. But another one, it can be used as how you can um, switch play. It's a more safer way of switching play as opposed to one midfielder who then's got to hit a 50, 60 yard diagonal to get you out. Um, so it depends how he's utilising the two sitting midfielders. Another aspect of that is that usually what, what happens when one, when one fullback goes, the other one swings round to offer cover. But if he's got two, he might be saying, OK, we're going to defend with six. And then the two wing backs, you go right up. And then your attacking midfielder can go right up to support the forward line. So, it, again, it's depending on how he utilises that um, those two holding midfielders. Yeah, the wing backs and full backs that they are, you know, they're going up and down, but they are part of what, what at times looks like an eight and eight, eight man defense, you know, which, which is bound to shore things up, really, it's, isn't it? It's difficult because when you're penned in, if you're penned in as a, um, as a back three, and then your wide players from the opposite team are causing your problems and they travel down, then what tends to happen is that your two wing backs fold back in. So now you've got a back five is what you've called. Yeah. So then it looks really de defensive because what's happened is your two wide players are pending your two wing backs. And now it leaves the full backs of the opposing team free. So you're consistently facing wave and wave of attack because you can't get out because the two full backs are, are free. What yeah. you have to try and do is, is to try and swing that back three round. So sometimes the back three becomes a back five. And I'll explain that by if that wing back, Birmingham City wing back on the left hand side is facing problems, then the left wing back goes out as a left back. And then you'll find the three centre backs should go to support, leaving the right side wing back a little more further higher or actually into a midfield position. But it's really difficult if you are under a pressure, under a lot of pressure, because then what happens is the two wing backs end up becoming a back five, goalkeeper six, two sitting midfielders seven, eight, and you struggle to get out. All right, yeah. So what you're saying, I mean, that sounds like the players are heavily briefed about those defensive duties then, right? So, you know, as, as part of this thing that the players are, are buying into to stop them to shore up the, what was a leaky defence, the players... You know, and those wide players, I suppose, you know, the creative players, you know, are, are is in the back of their minds, you know, listen, they've got to, they know they've got to defend. Does, does that affect, you know, the, the, the offensive mindset? Yeah, it can do. Um, because as, again, you know, it depends what your starting position is. So if, if the Birmingham City um, wide players, wing backs are starting behind the, the wingers, they're not naturally in a defensive position. And then the fullbacks are free. So then you're asking, is it your front players to go out and engage the fullbacks? Or is it your midfield free structure that now releases to go and engage the, the, their fullbacks when they come on? Because your wingbacks are starting behind the opposition wide players. Or you can be a little bit more braver with that by pushing your wingbacks in front of the wide players. So what you're saying to the opposition is if that ball goes out to the fullback, my wide players are in a position to go and spring to close you down. Then straight away, what should be happening with that is then the, the back three then move over to support that, that, that uh, wing back. So all of a sudden, your free centre-back becomes left-hand side centre-back 
right side centre back and then a literally false right back, the three centre backs, because we've all moved over to support that yeah. wing back who's bombed on. Does yeah, that you, make sense? It, it kind of, yeah. I mean, it's it's quite a lot to take in though for for the players, I guess, isn't it? But when you go, I mean, you, you know, when it's you got a big change like that, it's gonna, I can see it's gonna take time for everyone to kind of you know grasp and, and, it before it becomes second nature, right? And this is the thing, I'm giving you a lot of information in this short space of time, but this will be drip-fed over the course of weeks. And obviously it seems to be taking traction. Mm. But now imagine me trying to add attacking to that. Yeah, that's it. You just said, it's, a lot, it's a lot to take in. So what he's doing is obviously right because he's stemmed the goals. And I wouldn't, you know, whether he's doing literally what we're talking about or a form of that, defensively is it's working but you have to give the manager time or else as you just said it's too much for players to take up it would be and this is why it might be saying okay the next couple of weeks the block of training is going to move from defensive to now attacking how do we um how do we build from the back how do we exploit spaces what kind of movements do we need to to see in that in in his team yeah um you talked about long diagonals i mean does it at first, does it mean, you know, you, you pump it up and then find a, a big centre forward who can hold it up and let players join? I mean, Scott no, Hogan's it, playing up there. Scott, it was a bit difficult for him the other night because he, you know, he was just on his own. It was so difficult. Didn't, you know, barely saw the ball. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be long down diagonals in terms of switches of play. So if you watch Liverpool, Liverpool play the back five, but you will see diagonal balls from Trent, from Trent Arnold right over to the, the left side um, wing back. Um, what's his name? I've got the left left wing back now, Scottish lad. Uh, or, Robertson, Andy Robertson. That's it. Yeah. So mm. you'll see them both at times hitting um, hitting diagonals based on the fact that they keep their width. And it's only really when it becomes in defending situations do you find sometimes that back five will actually go to a back four, depending yeah. on where the opposition is trying to exploit their defence. Yeah, I was watching the the, 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 the uh, Craig Gardner and the likes, you know, a bit like you're getting into coaching or you're much further down the line than him, but explaining, you know, as the, the players coming in. It's, it, in other words, what we're saying, it's really quite technical, this, isn't it? And those, those, that transition, the change that's being made at the, at the club, it's going to take and a while. Can you, can you understand, Karen? No, so go on, Chris. I was going to say, can, can you understand the frustrations, though, from, from fans? You know, you see... Yeah, but how you know we we are not scoring any goals. I mean, how how are you supposed to make any progress if you can't if you can't score? It's all very well if you but if you lose one nil, okay. you might as well lose three. You know, I mean, it's uh you, you have to have a threat, don't you? I mean, as as when you're talking to your boys, I mean, you know, it's all very well having a, a great defence, but you've got to have some offence, haven't you? Yeah, you've got to have an offence, but I think. You know, you've got to you've got to put into the history and context of where Blues are at and what's happened. Um, there's been a lot happened to the club, and so what you find is that different managers will come with different ideas, and because there's been constant change, what then happens is that players have to then learn a different way of doing things, a different methodology. It's not a club's identity; it's a manager's identity. So therefore, that takes time for players to adjust to. It may be simple tweaks, but it may be, up, it may be asking a fullback to play in a completely different way as a wingback. It may be, as you mentioned, that the wingbacks might be now wingers who are asking to be a little bit more defensively minded. Mm. And so with constant change, it then, uh, it then um, brings questions to the, to the playing force of, do you know this style of play? Have you ever done it? Would, do we need to go over this a couple of times for you to actually get what I'm trying to say? But if you don't, if you don't stick to a methodology over a period of time, every 18 months when there's a change in management or two years, you're constantly changing style of play. Yeah, so it consistency. Then takes time to yeah. Yeah. So, so sometimes you're a victim of the, the, the lack of stability that a club um, um, brings because managers are just coaches are, are evolving all the time. Yeah, it's a it's a project. Uh, it is going to take time, isn't it? So I think the message you're saying is you know be be patient that that, that it, it will improve. Just from, from a distance, John. I mean, you I know you're you're an ambassador at Derby who have made a not a great start 
either. Yeah. <laughs> Five defeats out of the first six. Um, what, what do you make of Blues? I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the ownership is uh, controversial, should we say, because we don't know really who they are. Um, but, you know, the money's been sort of coming in. It's dried up a little bit now. And uh, the, the acquisitions have been uh, older players, loans, you know, uh, but players who the manager knows. So I mean, from what you you know, you, how you see things. Is it, is it, is it a, good, a good thing to, to bring in players who you know that, you know, they're, they're going to buy into what you're doing, that, you know, once, once the head's right, then results will, will come? In other words, you don't want yeah, players we, who are going to come in and just for the ride and go, what's going on here, you know? No, and, and, and again, you know, this is why recruitment's key, because you have to get the right sort of character. The character, what fits, whatever the values of Birmingham City Club is now you know we knew when i was playing quite clearly that you need to do x y z if you can't make that don't bother with this club and i think that needs to be clearly set in stone when you're recruiting players that these are three pillars that the expectations of this club demands so you can start to hold players to account and i'm sure um somebody like you know, the manager you've got in there now, Karanka, has those values. The, 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 and again, the difficulty is that once, that once it's changing again, you constantly lose the opportunity to develop a real strong culture because it might just be taking shape, manager goes. Another manager comes with another idea, it goes. So, so, it, it, so what you'll find over a period of time is a different characters that bring different things and then a new manager is asked to gel all that together. Yeah. But hold on, I signed for this manager and he wants to, well, I signed for this manager and he wants him to do it this way. And then those, those behaviours, those cultural um, factors that actually come out in play. Um, so if you get that time, as Karanka might hopefully get, then he might have an opportunity to really establish a strong culture based on strong values. Yeah. Is that the way you do it at the under 21s where you, where you, you, you have this doctrine where the players, it becomes second nature. So they, they're coming from clubs, aren't they? You know, from all different clubs, you know, you got Nketiah at Arsenal and, you know, and you've got players from, from, from some, some from lower levels because of, you know, the under 21s is, is, is more like that. Is it, do you, do you, can you, is it easier to get them to just to buy into it and change their philosophy or, or have you got to drill it into them like you've just been telling us? Yeah, I mean, we, are, we have, um, we're, we're blessed to say that we have such an amazing array of talent. You know, we, we work with the best under 23s in the country, which is phenomenal to, to sit here and say that. So they all come with their different styles of play. Some play, in a back, some play with a five, some play with a four, some play in aggressive press, some play low blocks. Um, there's all sorts of players that come into the camp, but they're all skillful. They're all intelligent enough to be able to switch. Yeah. What we have is a certain set of demands and behave behaviours that we want to see from any England player, any England England staff member that we all adhere to and buy into. So we already know what we get in, what we get in through the door, based on the culture, the values that A.D. Boothroyd and at the time Lee Carsley, who's who's now gone to the England under twenties, they put forward to say, right, these are the expectations of what we want to see not just on the playing field, but also why you're in the camps. Yeah, it's a, it's a project as well, isn't it, ultimately? Yeah. How are you going well, to do next summer, John? How do you think? It's, just, it's on the same time as the, as the, as the, the, the big Euros, isn't it? Um, Jude yeah. will hopefully be involved. He might even be involved with the seniors, you never know. Um, but, um, but how are you going to do, do you think? Well, I think we're, I think we're obviously take one step at a time. We've got the qualification... Um, is, is nearly done, even though we have qualified now. Then we enter the knockout stages. Um, so it's an exciting um, period of time for England. Um, exciting not only because of the, the qualification for the Euros, but exciting to see the amount of talent that we have at our disposal. I mean, and listen, we, we, we've got to be up there and thinking that we can go far in, the, in that competition. Um, I'm not going to say we're going to win it or we should win it. or But I think, you know, the expectations would be that in England, an England team, an England squad, should definitely travel in that competition. Yeah, it's uh, well. You think uh, from what we've seen so far, the way you've qualified, that you're going to have a good chance. Um, Blues, what, what do you think for this? I mean, from what you know, I mean, you've seen you know, bits and pieces, but is it 
when, when would you think, where would you think this season and beyond that in, in terms of, you know, what, what, a, what can be achieved? I think, I think a top half finish, I think is successful. Um, given all the, 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 the things that have happened over the last few years and new squad, new manager, um, settling into a new way of playing. Then there's this new way of doing things with coronavirus. I think Blues is definitely going to be impacted by the fans that by the fact the fans aren't in, yeah. Because it's one gate, one one ground you don't want to go to mm. is St Andrews when it's hostile, and so it's doing the opposition a favour actually when there's no teams in there at the moment. Yeah. Um. So I, I think you know if, if Blues can finish you know mid table upwards and looking up you know from position position ten upwards, I think it would be a great um great finish to the season and then again you look to build again and go again next season yeah and you think you know given that you know that the goals are at a premium they can still do that do you, do you think you know if yeah they're... absolutely I, I think you've got a manager that knows how to create I think what he's done is identified that you know what we need to stop the goals from going in first and foremost which is actually it looks like he's achieved even though you know you conceded one the other night in in the late minute stage of the game but predominantly that looks like it's been achieved. The next step of his management coaching will be okay. This is how we're going to be a little bit more expansive. Mm. Yeah, that's that, that. That would be the the big hope, I think. Now, just a word on Derby. Um, is Rooney going to take over? <laughs> um, I'm hoping that Philip can turn it round. If yeah. I'm honest, um, we've got a game against um, Forest on Friday night, tomorrow night live it's on big, Sky. Isn't it? A big local Derby. Oh, except there's no fans, yeah. so it'll be that'll be, probably be a weird result yeah. on that one as well. Yeah, there's no fans in there, but um, I'm hoping that we can get we, we can get it together. There's no getting away from the fact that we've had a real disappointing start to the season, but I'm optimistic that we can go there tomorrow and get a good result. Yeah, okay. And Michael Johnson, apart from being not quite prime minister yet, but you got all the badges, so <laughs> you, you know, and I think you can probably do a better job than uh, than Boris <laughs> uh, in, in some departments. Uh, what, what what is your? I mean, you're gonna how long are you gonna stick around with the FA for? Um, we'll see. I mean, uh, my contract um, expires at the end of this um, campaign um, with England. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to to work with some of the best talent in the country um, and obviously see different talent across the world, you know, get ready for a major tournament. Um, it's just been a fantastic roller coaster for me. So what I'll do is obviously see what happens with the when the contract expires and then we we'll go from there. Yeah, but is, is, is club management on your radar? Um, I'd say more sporting director, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, I think the opportunity to go in at clubs now, having studied the role as a sporting director at Manchester University there, having travelled Europe and managed to um, speak with a lot of the clubs in and around Europe, around the position, it's one that excites me because it's one that you get a chance to really build something. Um and, and that's what I, I'd like to be able to do one day, is to be able to build something from top to bottom in a football club, um, develop a real strong culture, as we mentioned, uh, with some real values that people can really buy into and, and allow people to be the best that they can be. Yeah, what, what is that job? I mean, a lot of people look at it and go, mm, somebody meddling from outside. Uh, at Blues, uh, uh, Christian Speakman, I don't know if you know Christian, he's... Uh, he's um, was he was from that Derby area? I think wasn't he originally? Um, yeah, sort of, he, he, uh, not massive experience, and you know, there's some say, oh, well, you know, well, maybe we could get a, somebody with more experience. What, what, do, what do you think? I mean, is he? Do you know much of him? Yeah, but Christian's a good guy, and I think he'd be perfect for the role. Um, you look at him. Well, that's what he's doing effectively. Of... I mean, he's head of the academy, but I think you know, generally, I think that's the the bigger picture with the, with, with the, the Hong Kong ownership. Well, he knows the club inside out, doesn't he? He's been there and he's helped develop the likes of Nathan Redmond, Demari Gray, obviously Jude Bellingham. Um, and he's, he's had his eye over the club for so many years, so he understands what the identity of the club sh is. So, um, yeah, I think he'd be a good acquisition. If that's, I didn't know that. I thought he would be in the, still in the academy, but if he's doing that... Yeah, role, he's, I, I think, think he's transitioning. I think there's a bit of, you know, uh, it's a kind of, you know, team effort in getting, getting the right players in. But as far as yeah. you're concerned, I mean, the, the, the sporting director role is, you know, it's, all, it's ide identifying players the, the top to bottom, no, right? No, I don't think it's just about that. I think there's a myth, and I think that's why when you say what does that role entail, um, um, yes, you identify players, but it's always the manager's 
um, prerogative whether he chooses to um, take the player. Um, he, nobody should be getting involved with, uh, you know, saying you, you're having this play. It should be the manager's choice because ultimately right. the manager would live or die by his decisions. So what are you doing? Um, so you are you, you so you're liaising with the management and the owners, are you? Are you kind of. Yeah, you're managing up and you're managing across. But I think the most important thing is that you're there for the long term. De, you know, developing a real strong culture and identity, yeah. and making sure that not only is that applicable to your academy, your staff, but also the players that are coming in. They've got to buy into what you're all about. Yeah. And then with all that, how do you thread that? You know, right the way through for the organisation. Um, and 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 so I think a lot of clubs on the continent have embraced it because they realise that um, with the constant transition of managers, how do you get to stability? How do you get continuity? Um, I think these are some of the things that Man United are talking about now. Whereas if you can get an identity and a style of play, you can be training an under eight, under nine, under 10, same way as your first team are playing, because this is what we do and this is how we do it. So yeah. that when that player comes into the um, first team, it's a lot more smoother transition based on the fact that they've been learning certain methodologies over the last 10 years in your academy. Um, and you start to grow your own it's financially more beneficial in terms of when you're bringing a player in, you know what you're bringing in. So when a manager leaves, which is you know, been the case more often than not in English football, you've still got the kind of players that actually fit your football club as opposed to players that actually just fit the manager. Yeah, it's all about uh, getting the, the off the field, the structure of the club right from top to bottom. That, that is what Blues have missed without a doubt in the last few years. Um, and you know maybe that will change now. And you mentioned Man United. I know that's been a problem there as well. I mean the criticism of, of, of Ed Woodward with that you know lack of clarity about structure and just buying players yeah. and then all the rest of it. it you, you know that's that's the job, isn't it? Yeah, that's the job. And I think the continent have been very successful with that. I think football has moved from where a manager now can just come in and just um, rule the roost. There's too much finances now involved mm. to get it wrong. And the game is, is far wider than when I started at Blues in the 90s. You know, you, you look at Sky TV, you look at the amount of media attention, you look at, the, you know, the attention, what you get on the social media platforms. You look at the academies, how they've evolved. Everything's evolved and it's... And you want to give the manager the best possible opportunity to be successful by just concentrating on the on-field stuff. All the off-field activities that a manager used to do now don't have the time to do, get somebody else to do that off-field stuff. And that is making sure your recruitment's right, your academy's coming up right, and just feeding into the manager when and, and if he needs that sort of information. Jono, you've been fantastic. Thanks ever so much, mate. I'm just sitting, looking at your shirt there. Is that your old shirt there in the background? Uh, 17? Yeah, I've got, I've got my blues one there, 17 from the Premier League. Uh, one or two other shirts as well. What's that number 30? Pardon? What's that number 30 in the back there? Is that? That was the Jason Roberts one. Jason Roberts. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, but that's yours. It's number 17. I can't remember what number you used to wear at blues. It was... Yeah, number 17. I've got a couple of shirts still from my time. So yeah. I'm in my garage. So it's a nice backdrop <laughs> when, I'm on, when I'm on these Zoom calls. Listen, you've been an absolute star. Thanks ever so much, mate. It's great to see you Pleasure. again. Uh, I remember, you know, a few years now since you were, we used to walk around the corridors of Parrot Blues, but you're obviously doing yeah. great things now with England. And uh, say hello to Jude and make sure he uh, does the business next summer. I'm sure he will. And, uh, and for you, pal, um, don't want Derby to finish above Birmingham City, but you know, <laughs> we, we, hope you don't, we hope you don't go down much. Um, yeah. <laughs> cheers, pal. And uh, keep cheers, right on. Take you. it easy. Cheers, pal. Dreaming of will be there.